Hi, this is SynthChaser from SynthChaser.com. In the last video, we had a little look at this Oberheim 4 voice, the different modules in it, and how they work together to make this awesome early programmable polysynth. This particular synthesizer belongs to a customer who reported he sent it to another tech to be restored. He shared a video with me of some of the problems he was having with the finished product. Each of the four SEMs here have an LED that indicate when the synth is receiving a gate signal. From the video the customer sent, it looks like SEM3 here is stuck on all the time, even when it's not being gated. So it looks like there's an issue with the programmer down here. Also, I'm sure you noticed the synthesizer quickly skipping through the SEMs as a key was being held. The customer thought that may also be a programmer issue, but I think it's probably just dirty or misadjusted key contacts and bus bars. When the synthesizer made it here to me, the stuck-on SEM had become an intermittent problem, so I suspected a mechanical connection type of problem rather than an electronics failure. And I tracked it down to one of these chips in the programmer with the yellow labels. These are some special envelope generator chips designed by Doug Curtis. These aren't the same as the CEM3310 envelope generator chips that would come later. These are special chips found only in the 4 voice and 8 voice. The need for these chips arises because while there's a Molex connector on the back of the SEM that takes a VCA control voltage, there's no interface to the SEM's envelope generators. So it doesn't take a control voltage for attack, sustain, or decay. Just one overall envelope. So the programmer can't directly deliver the attack, decay, and sustain voltages as set by the user on the programmer's panel here. The programmer has to have its own set of envelope generators to shape those ADS values into an envelope which is then provided to the SEM. Since there are two envelope generators per SEM, and if you'll recall from the previous video, each SEM can be programmed to a different patch, the programmer has eight of these envelope generator chips, four on this board, and four on the board below. The problem here was a chip for SEM3 wasn't firmly seated in its socket, and when I touched the chip, I could reproduce the problem with the SEM sounding without a gate. Since I pushed the chip firmly into its socket, the problem has gone away. Old IC sockets can be pretty unreliable, and since we've already had a problem with one of the IC sockets, I'm going to replace all the IC sockets in the programmer with modern, more reliable sockets to hopefully prevent this problem from surfacing again on this or a different IC chip. There are a couple other issues with the programmer that I'm going to need to troubleshoot. While there are only eight preset buttons, there's a slide switch here that switches you into a second bank of eight more presets. When the switch is moved into the 9 to 16 position, this LED lights up and the buttons numbered 1 to 8 really access presets 9 to 16. So here's preset 1 again. A problem that I noticed is that when you start moving around in the presets and then move back to a lower number, we've been moved into the 9 to 16 range even though we never touched the switch. And when this happens, we really are moved into the second bank of memory locations. It's not just a logic issue with the LED. So here we're on patch 3, which sounds like this. We'll move up and go back down. And since there's nothing in that memory location, we're not hearing anything anymore. A new problem presented itself since the synthesizer arrived here. The programmer no longer works from memory mode for SEMs 1 and 2. So you can see here the preset has been lost for SEMs 1 and 2, but it's still working for SEMs 3 and 4. If I put the programmer into manual mode for those SEMs, they work fine. If I then write to the memory from the current state of the programmer controls, we should hear the same thing we hear now when we access that preset. So let's write to the memory, and we'll switch back to memory mode. 
And sadly, it's not taking our patch that we wrote to memory. Since the programmer is a multi-layer stack of circuit boards, in order to troubleshoot and repair, I need to remove the boards above the fault. So I need to start with the problem on the board the deepest down, which I think is going to be the jumping into presets 9 to 16 problem. For that, I need to remove the two channel boards in order to get to and look at this overhead logic board beneath them. So I've removed the two channel boards, and I'm down now to the overhead logic board in the programmer. It appears someone recently replaced every single IC chip in the programmer and keyboard electronics modules. This is what's called a shotgun repair. There are times a shotgun approach is useful. For example, I sell kits for some of the older ARP synthesizers where ICs have a high failure rate. This way, someone without any troubleshooting tools or skills can go through their own synthesizer, replace chips, and hopefully avoid having to send it to a repair shop who may just wind up doing the same thing anyway. But there are downsides to a shotgun approach. If your soldering skills aren't very good, you can damage pads and traces, bridge traces, make bad solder joints, or the like. Also, particularly on the four voice, the logic may be dependent on a specific variety of IC chip to work correctly. Buffered versus unbuffered chips are a great example of this, or in some cases, even the timing of a specific manufacturer's chip over another's. A common example of this is the 4011 chip in the ARP Odyssey's oscillators. So by going through and replacing all these chips that were probably fine, the last tech has introduced a whole slew of new variables and created tons of opportunities for problems to have been introduced. Like I mentioned previously, the 4Voice programmer is a little bit complicated as it basically implements a tiny computer system out of basic CMOS building blocks. But as a professional being paid to do a repair, I think it's a better approach to take the time to understand the circuit and troubleshoot and repair the actual problems, rather than shotgunning due to lack of ability or motivation to study and understand the circuit. And I did notice that the ICs weren't shotgun replaced on the simpler SEM modules in the synthesizer, so that suggests it might be a reason for what went on here. And ultimately the proof is in the pudding. These boards were shotgunned, yet still have a number of problems. Here's the circuit that drives the select line, which determines whether you're in bank 1, patches 1 to 8, or bank 2, patches 9 to 16. So I troubleshot this part of the circuit, and it was very, very easy to find a problem with IC15, the quad NAND gate in that select line logic circuit. And if you take a look at the chip here, so this is IC15, uh, pins 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 have been bridged with solder during the replacement. So this is exactly what I said of uh, pitfalls to shotgunning, is that you open up the opportunity to introduce human errors, um, in this case with the soldering and bridging the joints. So I'm going to take this chip out. So here I've uh, desoldered the chip, and that bridge is, is so large that it actually stayed with the chip when I desoldered the, the pins. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove the bridge and test the chip. In this case, pins 4 and 5 are, uh, are uh, both an input and an output of the NAND gate. So um, depending on the second input, you can get in a situation where the, the chip is being pulled in two directions at the same time, and, uh, and that's not healthy for the chip. Well, it didn't destroy the chip, but I'm going to replace the chip anyway, uh, mainly because the leads were kind of uh, folded over to hold it in the, uh, onto the circuit board, and now they are uh, I don't want to mess up our nice new socket. And before I install that IC socket, I'm going to go clean up the fluxy residues left behind here from, from when the chip was, was last changed. I'm not going to go. It's clean this whole board, unfortunately, but at least the work that I'm doing is going to be clean. Here's the back side of that board, just a mess covered in flux from all the chip replacements. Okay, so I've put this circuit board back in there with our new chip, and we, we actually can power it on and run the synthesizer without the two channel boards. Obviously, we're not going to get any sound out of it, but we can test the uh, buttons here, and we can test our fix. And uh, we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, back to one. The LED stays off. The 
problem we were having before was when we went to a higher number and then back to a lower number, the LED would turn on. We'd jump into bank 9 to 16. Uh, now we can go backwards and it's fixed. Make sure this works up here in this mode and it looks good. So uh, we can sec secure this board down now and uh, put on the next board in the sandwich which is the channel board for uh, SEMs 1 and 2 and troubleshoot that problem. So troubleshooting this uh, memory issue on uh, channels 1 and 2 uh, taking a look at the memory chip here uh, control lines and, and data going into the chip seem to be okay uh, but data coming out of the chip is just missing and so it looks like the static RAM chip the 6508 RAM chip that was saving presets for SEM 1 and 2 in uh, bank 1 so programs 1 to 8 uh, that RAM chip has gone bad so I'm going to replace that chip and like I said before, while I'm, while I'm at it, particularly since I have the RAM chips out, the board uh, disconnected from battery backup, uh, I'm going to replace these IC sockets. So you see this socket is a uh, what's called a single leaf type socket. So the chip is only making contact with the socket at one place on the outside of its legs. Newer sockets, and you may opt to use a machine pin socket, but this is a this is a dual leaf socket, so you see that the uh, the leg goes right down in there, and uh, it's making contact with the leg on two sides. So that greatly increases the reliability of the uh, of the connection there, and it, it's kind of ironic because you know this problem was what caused the uh, um, envelope generator chip to to fail and, and SEM3 to sound when there was no um, no gate present. So everything on this board, all these IC chips have been changed except the, uh, this, the original unreliable sockets which were actually responsible for a problem they were left behind. So I'm going to change uh, bo all, both of these sockets and the ones for the envelope generator chips on this board and the board that will go above it. Okay, so I had uh, run out of 6508 RAM chips. I don't use them every day. And um, so what I did is I took the channel 1 and 2 board and I replaced the IC sockets for both the RAM and the envelope generator chips. I put the envelope generator chips back and for the RAM chips I took the pair from uh, the channel 3 and 4 board and I put them in here. And we can turn it over and I've written a, a patch into a preset one. I'll put it in unison. SEM 3 and 4 aren't sounding because there's no channel board for 3 and 4 in there. So we can go to a patch where I, I don't have anything written yet. We can see that it's quiet. I can go to manual mode here on channel 1 and 2. And we can write this into memory by pushing down the channel 1 and 2, the SEM 1 and 2 switches, and the write switch at the same time. Now we'll go back into memory mode, and the preset that we wrote to memory is there and working correctly. So the reason that I moved the RAM down to this board is now I can go ahead and reassemble this stack. I can change the IC sockets on the channel 3 and 4 board for the RAM and for the envelope generator chips. And I can put the programmer back together. And when the RAM chip comes in, I can just pop it in without having to disassemble the programmer again. This is the socket for the Curtis chip that was responsible for the problem with SEM3. You can see there that this leg of the socket seems to have uh, lost its tension or been, been pushed down there. So uh, definitely the right call to replace the socket even though the problem went away when seating it firmly. I'm going to go ahead and break the video here. It looks like we have enough work still left to do that we can continue with a second repair video. 
So in this video we took the four voice programmer apart and repaired a few issues. In the next video we'll tackle the remaining issues like the key bed and a problem with one of the SEMs. So stay tuned for that. This has been Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Thank you.